Um, I've I presented, I've actually prepared a quite complex paper which I'm not going to read to you because I decided this morning that that was a waste of time and I'd actually be better off. They're going to Oh, sorry, is it not working? Uh, sorry. Um, I've decided that I'll, I'll make a paper available to anyone who wants it and I'll, I'll give it to, to Sam so that it can be distributed to you. I think it's probably more important for me to talk about some of the issues and so I'm going to go through the slides um, and talk to them a bit and raise some of the issues. Um, I've, I've been involved, as said, by, in, in um, surrogacy uh, and alternative families for a long time. Um, my first involvement with surrogacy started in about 1983 and I was actually one of the psychologists involved in the baby Evelyn case, in, which has made legal history in Australia um, in surrogacy. So I, I've, I've had quite a broad range of experience. I'm very passionate about the children and therefore when I was asked to do this I was, I was very honoured because I, I think it's really important for us to actually consider the child because the children are the ones who are, the, who are at the heart of this and yet they actually have no choice about whether they exist or not. And I can reassure you that I've spoken to lots of children and they don't want to not exist, so that's not the problem. But they don't ask to exist and they need to have you understand some of their needs, I think. And sometimes that's really hard because you've got needs too. And, um, and sometimes people like me and people involved in the process aren't particularly great at, um, at recognising your needs and uh, recognising the needs of the children. So I, I want to talk about the needs of the children here. And in doing that, I'm in no way trying to suggest that you don't have needs but they have to join together, really. Um, so I'm going to put that in my arm, and I'm hoping that's right. So disclosure, disclosure in surrogacy needs to be long-term and planned. It needs to account for the developmental needs of the child. This is really important, and you need to know what those are and how they change, because they do change. Children's conceptual frameworks change over time. What a four-year-old understands is very different to what a nine-year-old understands. It's very different to the horrible teenagers that you get and then the adult they become. I've had three teenagers, but I haven't had my children through um, any form of um, assisted reproduction. Um, um, but I bet I have worked in this area for a long time. It also needs to occur in the context of the child's own family and community. One of the things that is important to talk about is family, because in Australia we have a very, um, traditionally a very narrow understanding of family, and, and I, I've certainly in my career been very, very passionate about changing people's perception that families are a mum and a dad and two or three kids, and that they always happen in exactly the same way, because that's actually not the reality. It's not the reality for the families and it's certainly not the reality for the children. And the problem for the child about the reality being different from what people perceive as being the norm is that they often see their form of family as being, diff because it's different, as being not as good. And that's not a good thing to have. Children need to believe and know that their family is just as legitimate as anyone else's family. Whatever way they came into the world, however they got to be in that family, that that family is as legitimate as any other family. And that's important in surrogacy. Um, so we have to look at surrogacy from the child's perspective. I had a colleague question me about suggesting that the uterus is donated in all surrogacy arrangements and I decided that I do consider that still to be the case, even if there's cost involved, um, because it's a very, a very special kind of arrangement. But donation, that, so, but surrogacy does involve donation. I think it, it involves the donation of the uterus, whether or not there's payment involved, and there's sometimes donation of over sperm and embryos, and that, those things are important um, from the child's perspective. So why do we need to disclose? I think the most important reason is, well, there, the, 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 there are important reasons. One's to protect the child and the child-parent relationship. Secrecy doesn't help that. Children need to know their, their story, and their story needs to be based on reality, not on a fiction. 
It also needs to, it's also needed because the child's developing personal identity needs to be um, put, put in place from an early age. Um, and I'll explain that as I go along. Um, parents need to be the ones who do disclose and it needs to be a controlled disclosure. And by controlled, I don't mean controlled as in the law. Um, I mean controlled as in you need to understand as parents that there's a, a need for it to evolve over time. That's because the child's conceptual framework is not the same at two as it is at five or nine or 15 or 35. It changes. You know, my understanding of the world's very different now to what it was when I was eight or 20 or even 40. Um, and I'm sure you understand, I hope you understand that too, but the great, greatest growth of that conceptual framework is occurring in childhood. So secrecy is not a good thing. Openness is important. It needs to be done carefully. There are studies that look at things, um, and I, I won't go into that. You can read it, but it's in the paper if you want to read it later. A lot of parents fear rejection. I've worked with families who have been created in alternative ways over many, many years, since 1982, and I have yet to encounter a situation where a child has rejected the parents for telling them about their, their, the, the history of their, their creation and birth. Then there are sometimes problems, and the later that you tell the child, the, the greater the, the, the accommodation problems can be, but the child doesn't reject you because you're telling them about the, the, their history. They will want to ask you questions, and they may be cross that you didn't tell them. Um, I haven't time to tell you an anecdote, so I'll just go on. <laughs> anyway, so let's look at the child's story. What's the child's perspective of surrogacy? To the child, it's, I was born to to a surrogate mother, that's the person who carried me. And I'm biologically related to one or both or neither of my nurturing parents. And I'm biologically related or not related to the surrogate mother. And other important facts include commercial versus, versus altruistic and whether I, uh, this arrangement occurred in my hometown or, or a long way away. And we're looking at this from a child's perspective. So other important facts about it are the, the, the actual construction of my family. Is it one parent, two parents, one, one mummy, two mummies, two daddies? What is it? What's my religion, my cultural background? And what are the other special facts about my family? Um, I want to talk about the developmental context. And I'm going to go through different ages. The paper will have more detail and, and some examples of how to do things. So if you want that, then please ask for it. But preschool, up to preschool, so I'm talking about up to five years, is really a time for setting the scene. It's the time for you as the parents to set the scene. A lot of it's about you getting used to it, you know, saying some of the words that are going to be hard to say like maybe later on. So getting used to that disclosure. It's important for the child in this time to learn about different family configurations. And some parents are really great at this, but you know, there are lots of different family configurations and you can see that you can see that at kindy you can see it in the playground you can see it um, on on their programs but and it's we're better at that now we actually do have different families depicted in stories um, it's also important for the child to understand where I belong in my family this is really important and they need to begin to understand about the pregnancy. They don't, they won't understand at all about birth and reproduction. Children will not get this. They don't get this until they're seven to nine. They don't understand about sex and reproduction. You can tell them and they may repeat it to you, but they don't get it, okay? They just don't get it. So you, but you can put the pieces in place. So you can give them some, the, the information you give them about the help you had and things like that, that's part of, part of where they're going, will help them. So they start to get that understanding. And I suggest to you that you actually create what I call a my story book. And that this, it's actually very similar to a baby book, but it, it's meant to have much more, to be much more long term. So this my story book is actually the story of me. And little kids love stories about <coughs> me. 
They all love them and they really like them when you allow them to hold them and walk around with them and let the dog eat it and take it into the bath and do all those things that kids do. And, if, and this day, in this day and age, you don't have to worry the way parents used to you know, 20 years ago because you've got it on computer. If the kid loses it, if it disappears into the water of the bath, then you can reproduce it. But having it and being able to carry it round, one of the most important things you're giving the child with that book is the permission to talk about me and my beginnings. And I can't underestimate how important that is. They can bring it to you, they can show it to you, they can ask for it to be the story to be read. If they haven't shown it to you for you know, a couple of weeks or a month or two, you bring it out and say, how about we read my story, your story, or, you know, whatever your child's name is tonight. I, we haven't read that for a while, I'd really like to do that, because you're giving them permission to talk about it. And that's what you need to be doing. It's okay, your story's okay, Things about how you were created and the way that you came into our family and our life are okay. So you need pictures, pictures about me, me being the child, stories about me before the birth, a book that they can handle, a book that clearly says that you love me and you love my story and then my story continues to grow. At five to nine, I'm, the child's starting to get out more into the world. They're, they're starting to be more aware of things. And at seven to nine, remember those years, <laughs> seven to nine they start to get reproduction. Okay, you might get one kid a bit younger and some older, but seven to nine is when they get it. You need to be sensitive to their needs. I mean, I remember trying to tell my seven-year-old daughter at, um, at seven because of her older brother had been ranting about sex to her and she wanted to know. And I, we, I took her to the park and started to, the, the story. She put her hands over her ears, started screaming and said, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I'm back off. You need to be sensitive too. They may not be right. Some things you have to back off. You need to know when to go forward and when to go back. If you're unsure, ask someone who can help you. There are people out there who can help you. But they, they need to understand some of these things and they need to get how it goes. Uh, one of the, uh, yeah, so seven to nine is when they're starting to move out and that's also, or five to, to nine, seven to nine is when you can start talking about reproduction. And that's when you can start talking about the surrogacy. You can start putting some of the, the, the fa biological facts in, if you like. 10 to 17, um, I've chosen 10 because it's a significant age. Um, and 17 being the top age of adolescence. There's two major processes happening here and they're really important and they go side by side and they're both really, really hard for you and for the child. And they're puberty um, and with it the transformation of the child from, from um, a child to an adult. And there's hormones and what you need to understand about hormones is that they magnify feelings by a factor of five, 30, 100, so if they're happy, they're happy. If they're sad, they're sad. If they're angry, they're really, really angry. Okay, so understand that. The feeling's probably true, but the hormones will affect it. It's a really hard time. They want to be alike, the others. The other thing is personal identity, and that's really important too, because this is the time, the, the development, where they, they have to create their own personal identity. And they need this to go into adulthood, where they actually have, um, need to have personal autonomy, autonomy sorry, and that they can become an adult and move on into adult things. So these two things go side by side and they're, they're not very nice sometimes. Um, developing personal identity, I don't like you, you're, not, you're, you're horrible to me. My children t told me regularly that I was the worst mother in the world. I'm sure I wasn't perfect, but I know I wasn't the worst mother in the world. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, the, the fury with which some of those statements were made to me um, was actually fueled by the puberty. So it's really hard sometimes when they're screaming and yelling at you to actually realise that this is actually normal, but that's what you have to do. It's normal for them to be want, to, want to be like everybody else. In, in teenage years, that's when they're trying to be the same. So you need to understand some of those things and try and put, um, put into context what's, that is, what, what's going on. So how and what to tell. You, you've got some time in that up to four years to get yourself ready. The child wants to know you love them. 
They want permission to ask questions. They want to know the special aspects of their birth, but they're not ready to know the full understanding of that. Um, and so then we move on four to nine. I'm starting to understand more. I need to know who else knows about the surrogacy and, and if relevant, the gamete donation. I still need to know you love me, and I also need you to be calm when I ask you questions. And sometimes trying to provide something for the children. We need to be um, encouraging people out there to understand that, that surrogacy is a form of parent of, of, of family. It is a form of family that children live in. Most children aren't going to know many people, many other children. Um, if you have friends who, who have done that, that's great. They may have that as an opportunity. But the majority of children don't know very many other people. It's not particularly understood. It's happening more, but it's still not particularly understood. And we need to help progress that, that, um, that understanding. And that means talking, saying things, talking to people. Talking about real things, not, not about people's worries, but talking about the reality. Talking about the reality for a child. I don't, I don't think it's fair that a child should feel guilty or horrible that they've been created in a way that other people might not like. The reality is the child exists. And these children exist, and we have a right as a community, uh, sorry, we have a responsibility as a community to actually um, enable those children to feel good about the way that they've come into the world and that, that their existence and their position in our community is just as legitimate as anyone else's. Um, I think, so I really do think that we, we need to talk about it and that we need to, to um, to discuss it, and there needs to be lots of opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably I've probably said enough. Thank you. Anyone with three questions for Sue? As a physician and been doing egg donation a lot of times, one an interesting question I've had. I, I always advocate to you. Okay, I don't want to be judge adjudicator. I don't know the right answer, but. A question that's frequently asked is, or, or a situation that comes up, is a couple has a, quote, genetic child, right? And then time has passed, and they want to have a second child uh, through egg donation, and they do. Now, do you think that it creates any kind of uh, tension in the family or a setup for favoritism if it's known that child A was, you know, is, is the genetic child of the mother and the child B is not? Do you think that could be, if there's disclosure, do you think that would be a problem? I, th I think. I think if you are honest, did people hear that question? Yeah. yeah. I think if people, I think honest is the best. Children, children can understand it. It's usually parents who can't, who, who, who can't cope with it. And children can't cope with their parents not coping with it. They really can't. If you can't cope with it, then they're in trouble. You have to get over your problem. And, and I think that if you, if you say to a child, we want another child, we want to have one just like you, but we couldn't, but we really wanted to have another child, so this is the way we're doing it. Most children want another kid. Most children want there to be a, a sibling. Um, uh, well, that's my, certainly my experience and, and my professional experience. So I think it's about how you tell and being honest and open and giving information that's relevant. That's why you need to understand about the developmental context. Yeah. Sorry, who was? You have the openness inside the house of where they came from and how they are living, and it's very accepted, right? But then you have like the, you know, the, the five-year-old or the six-year-old that tells the courier that came to the door that, you know, they're from this situation, or then they go to the playground and they tell the kids there, like, because they know inside their house that it's very open and free and discussed, you know, in that regard. But they don't have that social understanding that the rest of the world doesn't understand that it's... And you do need to protect the child in that situation. And, and it depends on your individual circumstances. But children from six to seven certainly understand the difference between... are able to hold... be able to respect something that's private. I like to talk about private and secret. As far as I'm concerned, the only secrets that are worth keeping are who I'm, what I'm giving my husband and my children for Christmas. Um, anything other than that sh is not sh is just is not helpful. Um, so it's about private, and children understand about private. 
No, um, they, they do, if you, if you explain it to them. And the reality is that if your child isn't going to be able to hold that information until they're a bit older, and they generally can by the time they're about eight or nine, sometimes you don't use the word surrogacy until they're eight or nine. You'd give them all the pieces. Because what, what we know from research is that if you give the child the pieces and then tell them, they think they've always known. Because all you've done is just add the pieces together. It's like the last piece. Oh, well, that makes sense. I understand it now. Um, it all, you know, and they have this sense that I've always known. So it's it's giving them the right pieces. And 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 but you know, yeah, children do. They like going. And they'll tell it for news. If you don't want it to be told for news at seven or six, then don't use that word. Use other things. It's fine. I've got twins who are four and a half, and they know, they know all about it. All the people in the shops know all about it. I think if people can do that, that's clearly a better way. But in some people's circumstances, that's not the case. No, no, no. There are circumstances where people can't, and then you then you have to use other methods. Yeah. I think the ten-year-old and the seven-month-old, I think saying too much, too young, can be, like it's what you saying about developmental stages. I told my eldest daughter too early, she thought she was a reject and her mother didn't want her and she was given away. So that's affected her self-esteem. Yes, and you, you do really need so to... I actually told it too much. Yes. Too, by yes. being honest, too, like too much detail. Yeah. That actually... You give them very that, little she detail. She thought there was something yeah. wrong. And yeah. oh, my mummy didn't want me, she, yeah. she, she, she gave me away. Yeah, yeah. That's very hard. Try to do the right thing and it backfires on you. Yeah. That's why trying to provide people with some <laughs> advice about telling. So, um, if it, uh, I'm happy for people to contact me too if they want to. Um, so, if you give me a card, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to send you an email or yeah. I'm sure, sir, you'll be available. I'm sorry, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs>